Okay, so my name is Nia Barrett. I'm the head of awareness raising for IOM West and Central Africa. And we're very excited to be implementing migrants as messengers phase two. So today I'm just going to give you a look at what's ahead. So the design of phase two was shaped by the results of the impact evaluation and other factors that emerged during the pilot, specifically the recognition that there is a need for migration information in the region, that empowering returnees is important, both at the individual level and in terms of the community, that campaign content and activities have to be tailored for different audiences, here to be your messaging works, and follow-up actions can strengthen the message, and we need to go one step further with this, and evaluation should not be an afterthought. So I'm going to expand on each of these over the next few slides and show you how the activities for phase two tie in. So we know that there's a need for information about migration in West Africa. So the phase one impact evaluation shows that there's a general lack of knowledge on the legal processes for migration, but also misinformation on the costs and risks associated with irregular migration. So this really underscores the need for these targeted awareness campaigns. So Migrants as Messengers Phase 2 will run for three years. Uh, it's fully funded by the Dutch government. And three countries that took part in Phase 1, which are Guinea, Nigeria, and Senegal, will remain part of the project in Phase 2. So these countries already have strong networks of volunteer field officers, and these volunteers are going to play a bigger role in the next phase. Then four new countries have been added, bringing the total to seven. So these are Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. And these countries were selected for several reasons, including migration trends, high numbers of assisted voluntary returns, and synergies with existing activities at the national level. The second finding from the Phase 1 impact evaluation that shaped the design of Phase 2 is the importance of empowering returnees. So not only can their stories help to shape, help to impact how their peers perceive the risks of irregular migration, but involvement with the Migrants as Messengers project can give returnees a sense of purpose, a community, and essentially help to support their reintegration. So the returnees involved with Migrants as Messengers are called Volunteer Field Officers, or VFOs. Um, and while they have been discussed in other presentations today, I think it's important to understand how their role evolved during the pilot. So in Phase 1, the VFOs were recruited across the three countries. Um, they were, each one was a return migrant, and they were trained to operate these smartphone filming kits and then went out to the communities to record video testimony from other return migrants. These videos were then edited by IOM and disseminated by the project stakeholders. But through this work, as you've seen in other presentations today, the role of the VFOs became much larger. So they facilitated community discussions, they organized events, and they spoke about irregular migration with media to schools and other organizations. And importantly, each of the VFOs brought their sort of individual interests and skills to their role, which added a new dimension to how the testimonies and the messages were shared. Um, we also saw VFOs starting their own returning-led associations, as Amy mentioned. So just to give you a couple examples, um, Adama Diallo, you saw his video earlier. So he is a VFO in Senegal, and through Migrants as Messengers, he essentially built his skills as a facilitator and a journalist. So he now holds regular tea debates in his community to talk about irregular migration, and he's interning at a local radio station. Chris is a VFO in Nigeria, and he's also an actor. So during Migrants as Messengers, Phase one, he was able to leverage his connections in Nollywood, which is the Nigerian film industry, to bring attention to returnees and promote safe migration. So he's now the director of a traveling theater group that raises awareness about the risks of regular migration. And Mariam is a VFO in Guinea, so she was very active in engaging women and girls in dialogue about irregular migration and in 2018 was one of the founding members of an association focused on preventing irregular migration of Guineans. And this association now has 350 members across the country. 
So considering this evolving role of VFOs in the pilot phase, phase two has been designed to provide a stronger platform for VFO participation. So to start, the existing VFOs from Guinea, Nigeria, and Senegal will participate in train the trainer workshops. And then we'll work with IOM staff on recruitment and training of the new VFOs for phase two. Secondly, we'll be conducting more skills training workshops. So this will depend on what the VFOs want to improve. Um, during the pilot, they express interest in learning more about public speaking, fundraising, project management, and social theater. Thirdly, we will continue to train VFOs to film the testimonies of returned migrants, and we'll be providing the equipment to do this. Um, but we're also going to train interested VFOs to edit these videos, rather than sending them all to IOM for editing. And we think this is going to uh, provide more autonomy over the production process. Some of the events uh, scheduled for phase two are going to be run by the VFOs, um, using their own sort of creative ideas and skills to shape these. And we're going to be exploring how we can support some of these associations that have been started by VFOs, such as the one that Mariam started in Guinea. Um, and this might be through capacity building or logistics. Um, and finally, we're sort of putting mechanisms in place to, to develop stronger ties between the VFOs. Um, this includes an online platform and regular meetups for VFOs across the countries. So overall, we see the role of VFOs in phase two being strengthened, being tailored to their interests and needs, and with a view to set in place mechanisms for sustainability of the project's objectives. The next finding that fed into the design of this phase is the recognition that targeting is key. So the overall goal of Migrants as Messengers is to empower young people aged 17 to 25 to make informed decisions about migration. But we know that decisions about migration may not solely be made by the individual, and so it's important that the project targets family, friends, and peers. Uh, this group may play an influencing role in the primary audience's behavior. And we feel that it's not enough for us to expect substantial change in the way decisions around irregular migration are made if we don't look at sort of the broader social and cultural factors. Um, and so to create an environment where this behavior change can be sustained, we're be targeting also a third audience of media, young influencers, community, and religious leaders. And I think this was brought up during the Q&A of the um, impact evaluation from phase one. So to reach these three different audiences, uh, phase two is going to adopt a multi-channel and multimedia approach. Uh, for example, uh, we know that we can reach some young people online, but if we're speaking to their mothers, we may need to be on the ground. The activities here form the bulk of the project, um, and I will discuss each one uh, in detail. So at the core of Migrants as Messengers are the peer-to-peer -peer video testimonies. Um, the results from the impact evaluation show that returnees are a trusted source of information on migration, and that their emotional messages had an impact on increasing risk perception and decreasing the intention to migrate irregularly. Uh, in phase one, there were 5,000 testimony clips collected, and in phase two, we're looking at collecting about 20,000. So just because we collect clips doesn't mean they're published, so it would roughly work out to about 750 videos that are actually published online, not 20,000. <laughs> um, we know that the type of message you get and how you get it may have an impact on whether it contributes to any form of behavior change. And so for phase two, we're putting a lot of emphasis on testing. So this will include testing videos before they are published and also testing the messages we're using across our communication platforms. And we're going to do this through focus groups in coordination with our VFOs and the target audience. Dissemination <coughs> campaign is going to be online, on air, and on the ground, targeting both rural and urban areas. In terms of online, in phase one, the Migrants as Messengers Facebook page acted as a hub for these testimonial videos, which were then shared by stakeholders on their own social media platforms. 
In phase two, we're looking to leverage other digital platforms and really tailoring each digital strategy for how young people in that country interact online. On air, we'll be working with television and radio stations to sort of amplify the reach of the content um, and to give a louder voice to our VFOs and other partners that we're working with. Um, community radio, we believe, will be uh, very important in some of the more remote areas of the countries. And on the ground, uh, we'll be working closely with all of these three identified audiences. So for example, we will have 100 student outreach activities, mainly in high schools and universities. Uh, we'll be working with local theater companies and performing artists to hold community events um, that will promote dialogue on irregular migration. We're planning 14 caravan road trips um, to bring the campaign's videos and messages to the more remote areas. Um, and then finally, every December, we'll be holding community screenings and discussions around IOM's Global Migration Film Festival. Across all the activities in Phase 2, partnerships are going to be a driving force, um, both to support dissemination of the media content, but also to help create this environment where discourse on irregular migration is encouraged and real conversations about informed migration and the choices that young people have are at the forefront. Uh, so with all of our partnerships, there's going to be an emphasis on capacity building that is tailored to the partner. So for example, media trainings for journalists on terminology and balanced reporting when it comes to covering migration stories uh, or training for community organizations to design and hold their own activities. In all of the phase two activities, uh, we'll be working to increase female participation, so as VFOs, as messengers, and as the target audience. Um, of the VFOs expected to be recruited, at least 20% will be female, uh, so we'll be working with women's associations to better reach female returnees, and we'll make sure that all our trainings, focus groups, and other events that the VFOs participate in are organized in like, protected spaces where sort of trust and respect can be built amongst this network of VFOs. Phase one showed that it's initially more complicated for female returnees to share their testimonies. Uh, these often include um, events of sexual exploitation. So to address this, our female VFOs will lead engagement with potential female messengers, um, and they can decide how to best share their experience and frame their narrative. And then even though women are perhaps a minority in the migrant population, um, they play a role in the decision of people to migrate, both men and women. Um, and we think that mothers in particular can be a driving force in terms of mobilizing resources for their children to travel. So in phase two, our female VFOs uh, will take the lead in shaping women-to-women -women dialogue sessions with an aim to better reach women um, who are considering migration uh, or playing an influencing role in someone else's decision. And now to the final area that influenced the design of phase two, which is that follow-up actions will strengthen the message. So a finding from the impact evaluation from phase one is that the project uh, may not have had a substantial effect on factual knowledge regarding migration. And so what this means for this phase is that we need to go one step further to give the audience the ability to make informed decisions about migration. And to do this, we're building on synergies with existing projects in West Africa. For example, we're looking to leverage the IOMX digital platform, uh, which is funded by the German government and will launch later this year. Uh, so in its pilot phase, this website will provide young people in Guinea and Nigeria with information they need to make decisions around migration. So this includes how to migrate regularly, um, who you can speak to in person, and also local opportunities. We hope to expand this platform to cover all seven migrants as messengers countries um, in the coming year. And then tying into this, there are national level projects um, in the West Africa region that are piloting the use of WhatsApp as a way to easily connect with young people looking for information about migration. Um, and we think that these platforms together can 
can provide sort of tailored national level calls to action that can be promoted with migrants as messengers materi materials and activities. And then finally, my last slide, um, before we get into the evaluation component for phase two, just to speak very briefly on the timeline. So in year one, we're looking at uh, setting in place many of these foundational steps, um, so recruiting and training VFOs, establishing partnerships, and developing on and offline strategies. In the second year, the focus will shift more to content production and dissemination. And then the third year will very much be characterized by ensuring the sustainability model is working. And the sustainability model is really at the core of all project activities, um, where the ultimate aim is to build on this migrant-centered approach and set the right structures and mechanisms in place to allow it to be replicated and scaled by the VFO networks. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jasper now to just explain a little bit about the impact evaluation plans for phase two. Um, thank you. Yeah, just very, very brief. Um, we mentioned some of the ideas that we're going to investigate further already in, in the previous discussions. We are uh, very thankful for this unique opportunity because the phase two is a huge project and 15% of that big project will be dedicated to a set of evaluations and I think this is really a, a kind of new land for, for IOM and this is an incredible opportunity that at this scale we haven't had in, uh, in the past. So. Um, what we're going to look at is at different group effects to look at what are the effects of these campaigns on women um, versus men. We want, to, we want to look at the effects in more rural settings versus urban settings. We want to break up certain age groups and look at different effects um, on, on populations with different previous uh, information levels uh, and so forth. Then we want to look at what are the effects of online campaigns. Um, it, we discussed it has a lot, of, a lot of potential supposedly, but we don't really know what the effects are, who we're actually talking to um, online. Uh, thirdly, we're going to look at the influence of peer effects. Uh, what is the effect of the mother, the uncle, the father, the, the, the siblings, maybe the context abroad in the diaspora. Um, we, we will try to achieve that apart. And then lastly, also to look at behavior. This would be very tricky. Um, to, to, to measure actual movement and who leaves and who doesn't and why and whether information that we provide had anything to do with it. But, um, so there's a lot of uh, exciting work to be done there in the next uh, three years. So um, lastly, I will hand over to uh, <laughs> Frank uh, Lashko, the director of GymNAC, to, to provide some closing remarks. Good. Thanks very much, Jasper. Okay, good. Okay, thanks very much for all of that. Um, I have a few remarks, more for IOM, I think, than maybe for an external audience, maybe for our donors as well. Look, we are a 68-year-old organization, and I think what I heard from Diane Cartier today is we don't have a single full-time impact evaluation officer. We do not have an impact evaluation unit. In IOM. All this work is being funded by projects, temporary projects. Um, and yet, we are spending millions of dollars implementing migration projects around the world. And the discussion we've had today is not a completely new discussion. Back in June 2011, with the World Bank and on behalf of the Global Forum on Migration and Development, IOM organized a two-day conference in Marseille solely on the topic of, of impact evaluations and how they could be used in the migration field. And the reason why we did this with the World Bank is because if you look at what the World Bank does, they have a whole unit that is focused on conducting impact evaluations. They actually carried out something like 300 impact evaluations in recent years. They started with... Um, I think with a low level of around 50 uh, about 10 years ago, um, so they're up to 300 or more. So we felt that potentially we could learn from the World Bank and that we should be trying to encourage IOM to develop a stronger evaluation culture. So here we are, 10th of September 2019, it was a great discussion today, 
But I hope that this is going to have an impact, not only on information campaign work, but all the work that IOM does across the field. Now, we have heard that there are some disadvantages in using impact the impact evaluation approach. It's not a panacea for everything. We need a multitude of approaches. And the evaluation work has in increased in IOM. We have more M&E officers scattered around the world. But we're not really doing this type of evaluation very often. And uh, I think there is potential, I mean, this, this, this next phase of the project, I think, is going to be important, not only to help us understand about information campaigns, but it is also going to be important for the rest of the organization. And especially now, when the entire organization is asking, why do we collect data on migration? How do we use that data? How can that data help us to provide a better service to migrants and to better implement our, our programs and also help our member states to implement better policies. So I think this, is, this, is, this discussion today has been incredibly important. Now on the cost question, one of the things we discussed in 2011 with many countries who came to this GFMD meeting was how to share costs because everyone knows that impact evaluations can be costly. So clearly in the case of this subject, surely there are many other countries besides the Netherlands who would be potentially interested in the results. And one wonders why countries don't come together to share some of the uh, costs for actually doing this type of, uh, of work. Um, the other thing that was mentioned by Mary Luce is we don't know what happens if you don't spend money on impact evaluations. You could be wasting a lot of money doing something completely wrong and that could cost you much more money than the cost of doing an impact evaluation. So you have to bear in mind that cost when you're thinking about this. The other thing that we have to think about in terms of cost is we're collecting all this data. It costs a lot to collect it, but we don't fully analyze and utilize this information. What's technically called secondary analysis in the jargon is basically making sure that you fully utilize all the information that you've collected for a range of different purposes. And we don't do that because we're busy thinking about the next project. And we don't have, because we have a very projectized model in IOM, there's no unit that is, is responsible for extracting this information and thinking how it can help us develop better uh, projects in the future. Um, so I, I found uh, today extremely enlightening. I think it's really important work and I, I'm glad that our, the data center in Berlin can help to support this work but as, as I said right at the beginning all of this is being funded out of projects and I think the, the, the key message for IOM is that and one of the messages I, I heard today from other agencies is there is great value in investing in this area of work and uh, we should be really thinking much harder about how we can uh, utilize uh, impact evaluations and the capacity that we're currently building up um, through GIMDAC and, and in working with colleagues in the field. So that's all I want to say because I saw that the lunch is outside and we, yeah, I'm sure you're all very hungry and this has been a long morning. But the final thing I, I think I have to say, Jasper hasn't given me the list, but there are a lot of people who need to be thanked here. Um, MCD, the GIMDAC team and Gervais uh, Pab and all the speakers, our donor from the Netherlands and uh, all the people, all of you, and all the people who are out there um, in cyberspace are watching us. Um, so thanks to everyone. I think it has been extremely uh, valuable, and uh, I look forward to seeing the results of the next phase. So thank you. Bye -bye.